I'm going to be talking today about a project, which is still actually a fairly new project uh, during my postdoc in uh, Maastricht. Um, and it's about a, a novel long, long coding RNA called Titan Antisense 1. Um, and we've identified it as a sex specific or promising sex specific biomarker, as well as a novel molecular regulator uh, for therapy in HEFPEF. So just a quick um, overview of my talk today. So I'm going to start off with an introduction um, about HEFPEF and then uh, focus on this a female sex specific biomarker um, and then its therapeutic potential and then the future perspectives. As I said, this is a fairly new project, so a lot of it is quite early data. So it's also great to get your feedback about this project at a fairly early stage. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF is a complex systemic inflammatory syndrome. Um, and it's closely associated with comorbidities, including metabolic syndrome, obesity, uh, type two diabetes and hypertension, as well as renal dysfunction. Um, and there's also a, a sex difference in that uh, two thirds of patients are consistently actually female. And there's also an aging um, association with a risk factor with this syndrome. Let me just change to laser point. We went through this earlier, there we go. Um, so these comorbidities are thought to um, contribute to a, a chronic systemic inflammatory uh, status, which contribute along with the comorbidities to changes in the heart. So these include cardiomyocyte hypertrophy um, and passive stiffness of cardiomyocytes, uh, perhaps through titan stiffening, um, as well as metabolic uh, toxicity and lipotoxicity, such as lipid accumulation in the heart, uh, collagen, uh, increase in collagen production, as well as collagen cross-linking and increased production of proteoglycans. There's also seen to be endothelial cell dysfunction and capillary regression, and also local inflammation in the heart itself. So all these changes in the heart brought about by the comorbidities uh, contribute to this uh, syndrome whereby the heart uh, becomes stiff and it cannot fill up as effectively during diastole. And this is in contrast to the classic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction where instead the heart can't pump as effectively. Both forms have a similar out, uh, outcome. They both have a reduced cardiac output and a decline in health. So um, this form of, of heart failure is by no means uh, less common or less uh, severe than the classic HEF-REF. In fact, about 50% of patients that are hospitalized for heart failure have this kind of heart failure, HEF-PEF, with preserved ejection fraction. So you can see here, this is one study actually from a hospital in Ireland, in Dublin, um, where they've shown uh, uh, 4,910 consecutive patients admitted to the heart failure clinic and you see this bimodal distribution of ejection fraction. So about 50% of the patients admitted have a reduced ejection fraction, so below 40%. And actually most of these are male, whereas the other half um, have a preserved or normal ejection fraction, so above 45, 50%. And most of these are actually female. And this is quite consistent in different registries and centers uh, across the world. Um, not only uh, do we have, uh, we have an unmet need for effective therapies as well as biomarkers, so clearly ejection fraction, which is measured by an echo, is not a good diagnostic tool for this type of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, in addition, the classic um, diagnostic biomarker, BMP or NT pro BMP, which is used for heart failure, is actually normal in about 30% of HEF-PEF patients. This is also has low sensitivity for diagnosing HEF-PEF. In addition to not having many uh, good biomarkers for HEFPEF, we also don't have a good uh, set of tools for, for therapy. So in, consistently in many registries and trials, the classic drugs that are administered to heart failure patients, mostly acting on the neurohumeral system, uh, consistently do not reduce death rates or rehospitalization re rates in HEFPEF. So for example, we've got a trial here using ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, um, also with um, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. And these are not consistently effective in HEFPEF patients like they are for HEFREF. So we have a full uh, uh, toolbox for treating HEFREF patients, but we really still quite, um, uh, her box is still empty when it comes to treating 50% of heart failure patients or HEFPEF patients. So there's an urgent unmet need for uh, new effective therapies and biomarkers. And that's a problem that we're trying to address. So I'll talk now about this specific biomarker and how we identified it. So um, as I explained earlier, um, HEFPEF is at least thought to be caused or 
there's an association with uh, systemic inflammation as well as inflammation in the heart. Um, and some papers um, from our collaborators in Dublin, uh, Chris Watson and, uh, and Mark Ledwich, they looked at circulating white blood cells in, in HEFPEF patients compared with um, at-risk uh, at risk patients. So they also are hypertensive, so they have similar comorbidities, but they don't have any diastolic dysfunction yet. And they also had a set of patients that had some diastolic dysfunction, but no signs or symptoms of heart failure yet. And they analyzed a number of different white blood cells in the circulation of these patients. Um, and actually they saw particularly the CD14 positive monocytes. These are the classic um, monocytes that have uh, invasive tissue potential and potential to different, differentiate into macrophages. They saw these elevated already at the stage where you have uh, diastolic dysfunction, but no signs or symptoms of heart failure. So this is indicative that actually this, the inflammation is um, causative to the changes in the heart. So it seems to happen at least very early on um, before you actually get other signs and symptoms of heart failure. Um, so this is just the figure there from their paper showing this trend. And so the white blood cells are, are now seen to be maybe a target for treating heart failure. So our lab um, is interested in these, in these white blood cells um, with regards to HEFPEF pathophysiology as well as biomarkers. Um, so we, together with people, with the group in, in Dublin, we also uh, isolated CD14 positive monocytes from asymptomatic at-risk controls. As I said, these are uh, individuals with hypertension and diabetes often, but they don't have any uh, signs or symptoms of heart failure and they still have good diastolic function. Um, as compared with HEFPEF patients. We isolated the monocytes and we performed some transcriptomic analysis as well as proteomic analysis. And these experiments have a twofold um, um, goal. So first of all, to identify potentially uh, circulating biomarkers, these white blood cells are circulating, they can be easily isolated from blood, as well as understanding more about white blood cell biology um, in HEFPEF, given it seems to be a driving factor. So this is the results of the RNA sequencing. Um, so first of all, uh, this is a, a, what we call a principal component analysis. So this shows similarity of the transcriptome. So this is the total transcriptome of the white blood cells. We're sequencing all, all RNA species. Um, and we can basically look at the comparison globally of the transcriptomes in the different um, individuals. So you can see here that the um, decoding RNAs, they segregate um, actually more between um, male and female than they necessarily do between uh, the, the at-risk and the HEFPEF. This was also seen actually even more starkly for the long non-coding RNAs. This uh, RNA sequencing includes long non-coding RNAs. So here we get some really distinct clustering. So the males compared with the female HEFPEF a very separate, very different, as well as even the, the at-risk control, not even uh, disease individuals are very stark for the long, long coding RNAs. So this made us think, you know, we're obviously looking a lot at proteins um, and also at messenger RNA, but maybe actually the long, long coding RNAs um, are more underlying the sex differences as well as the pathophysiology of HEFPEF, at least with regards to inflammation. So this is just looking back more a global overview of the RNA sequencing experiment and looking at the types of genes and processes that are up and down regulated. Um, so first of all, this is comparing the, combining both sexes, comparing at risk with HEFPEF. So there's actually only 163 differentially expressed genes between the, um, between the at risk and, and uh, diseased when you ignore sex. So it's not quite a modest number of genes. 40% are downregulated, 6% upregulated, 18 of which are long non-coding RNAs, and some are also pre-RNAs, and only seven are X encoded, which you might expect a lot of genes on the X chromosome. So the types of processes that are differentially regulated between the two groups, so a lot of them that you would expect, antigen binding, um, a lot involving uh, endocytosis and autophagosome. So this indicates maybe they're more inclined to differentiate into macrophages, these are macrophage properties, um, as well as some metabolic processes. When we actually then compare the, um, the disease, the HEFPEF male and female, we actually get far more differentially expressed genes, even though these both in principle have the same kind of heart failure phenotype between male and female, we actually get a lot more differentially expressed genes, nearly double the number, 375. 
Um, 78 of these are on the sex chromosomes, so maybe you would expect that. And actually a lot of these, 18% are uncharacterized long non-coding RNAs. And those genes that, uh, that are characterized and we do know a function for, we put through gene ontology analysis again. And again, very different processes came up as differentially reg uh, regulated between male and female HEFPEF -hef, um, patients. So for example, a lot more involving transcriptional processes like alternative splicing, epigenetic processes, lots of demethylases, um, as well as some MHC class two uh, proteins. This is just an overview of the, of the type of um, pathways that are differentially regulated between these, da these data sets. And of course, there's lots of information you can get from these and the other people in our lab are following up on other targets. And we're also now uh, validating this data set in CD14 positive monocytes from another registry called the Helpful Cohort, which is uh, based in, in Utrecht. So I'm going to talk today about one of the targets that came out of this data set. Um, and it's a, a called Titan Antisense 1. And it's an annotated but uncharacterized uh, long non-coding RNA that was upregulated in the monocytes of HEFPEF patients specifically. So as you can see here, this is just the quantification of the RNA-seq data. So it's also got a moderate um, expression level for a long non-coding RNA, especially one that's not been characterized before. And this long non-coding RNA, as its title suggests, is antisense to Titan, the Titan gene, which, is, uh, which comprises at least 10% of muscle protein. So this candidate caught my eye, partly because it was one that was specifically upregulated in the females and not in the males so much. Um, it was also an uncharacterized long non-coding RNA that had a reasonable expression level. But at a very basic level, I thought, what on earth is anything to do with Titan doing in white blood cells? Um, and so you can see here in the human genome, this is actually an annotated antisense RNA opposite the Titan gene. And this is an example from the monocyte sequencing. This is a sequence alignment showing the RNA seq reads down here. And you can see here the Titan, which would be above here, normally in red, is not expressed in white blood cells, which you would expect. But the Titan antisense is, uh, there's a number of reads for Titan antisense at a moderate level, as I say. So it also implies an independent regulation of this Titan antisense, and it's not just a byproduct of Titan expression, which is what a lot of these antisense transcripts were originally thought to be. It's just RNA polymerase is in this place at the same time, so it's just transcribing the opposite strand. We now know that that's not the case in many instances, and it seems to also be here. So I wanted to follow up on this candidate. So this is a validation at a level of qPCR already in the helpful cohort that I mentioned. So it's a case control um, prospective study based in Utrecht. And it's actually, uh, so it recruits healthy individuals as well as those with diastolic dysfunction. So we've also got quite a nice gradient of uh, different levels of diastolic dysfunction. So at the level of qPCR, there's an increase again in the HEFPEF monocytes of this Titan antisense. And when you separate out the sexes, you can see that most of this increase is from the females rather than the males. So rightly or wrongly, I then uh, wanted to know what was going on in the heart. Um, so I came from a background about cardiomyocytes. And again, this relation to Titan, I wanted to know if it was expressed in the heart. So I look back at some RNA sequencing data that we already have in the lab. This is actually from a dilated cardiomyopathy patient. Um, and indeed, uh, the top here, you can see the reads for Titan, very highly expressed in the heart, as you would expect. And the Titan antisense also seems to be expressed um, in the heart itself. So I then, um, through some, some wonderful collaborators, uh, managed to have access to some uh, cardiac tissue from HEFPEF patients. And this is quite rare to get because um, biopsies are not commonly taken in HEFPEF patients as routine yet. Um, so actually these were mainly patients that were suspected to have inflammatory cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they were taken, it later turned out to be HEFPEF, so they're quite rare to get. Um, so through collaboration with Nazar Hamdani in Royal Bochum University in Germany, as well as uh, Rancha gonzalez Micro in, um, in Navarra in Pamplona, um, I uh, analyzed Titan antisense expression in the cardiac biopsies and also compared them with say control. These are just non-failing. They're not totally, totally healthy, but they don't have heart failure. Compared it with um, HEF-PEF um, and also HEF-REF um, in the case of this cohort here. And you can see consistently there's an upregulation of Titan antisense in the female HEF-PEF uh, that is not seen in the males, nor so much in the HEF-REF. 
So it's expressed in the heart and it's a very stark trend and it seems to be quite consistent, at least in uh, biopsies from several centers. We were originally looking for uh, biomarkers as well. So another question that I've had was, is it detectable in plasma or serum? So surprisingly, it uh, was actually quite readily detectable in plasma um, by qPCR. And we actually had um, plasma samples from some of the same patients that we had from the biopsies. Um, and again, we see the same trend in the plasma. So there's an increase in titan antisense in the female HEF-PEF, which is not seen in the males or in the HEF-REF, at least to such an extent. So we're now following up on this, and we've also got a bit more data from other centers, but it's all quite low end numbers still. Um, and we have permission now to analyze 300 patients each from, um, from Singapore. So this is actually, this publication is from the Singapore, the SHOP study. And um, we're now following up, it's actually in the, the sequel to the SHOP study called the ATTRACT study. Um, again, a, a prospective case, uh, case control cohort and they have 800 patients we're analyzing, 300 to start off with. In the helpful study, again, we're looking in the plasma and 300 patients. So we really want to um, make sure this is, uh, really validate this is a biomarker, and of course you need to do multi-center, ideally um, international, overlay the um, analysis with the, the comorbidities, make sure you have deep phenotyping data. So that's what we're working on now, um, to really see if this is something that could be a new sex-specific biomarker for HEFPEF. It certainly looks promising, the preliminary data. So now onto its therapeutic potential. So we've seen that Titan Antisense is expressed in the heart in humans. Um, and of course, we can look at associations um, from the cardiac biopsies that we do have with the, with the comorbidities and with the degree of disease. We can't do any functional studies, of course. So I also wanted to know if it was present and expressed in models of HEF-PEF. So looking in two models here, and we have looked in more as well. So the ZSF1 rat model. So this is a, a classic model of metabolic syndrome and diastolic dysfunction um, generated by a cross between the leptin receptor um, mutation and the spontaneous hypertensive heart failure rat. And by about 16 to 18 weeks, they have diastolic dysfunction. And it's also upregulated in the heart in these um, rats. Also in a pig model, uh, which is also induced by comorbidities, uh, diabetes mellitus, um, kidney dysfunction, high fat uh, diet and uh, hypertension. It's also upregulated in the heart of these pigs. We only have female pigs in this case. Um, the male pigs, I think, reacted differently actually to the comorbidities. And again, through collaborators in Leuven with Liz Jones and in uh, Rotterdam with Dirk Dunker, we had access to this tissue. Now, in both these individual uh, models, actually, the titan itself isn't even annotated. So it took a bit of a homology analysis to identify it. So you can just see here, this is uh, well, the pig genome, a pig RNA-seq. I mean, titan isn't annotated, but I did some homology analysis, and you can see here, this is clearly titan. It's very highly expressed, and you can also see reads for the titan antisense in blue as well. So the next question is, is the titan antisense only upregulated in the heart tissue because it's whole heart tissue we've used until now um, because there's infiltration of white blood cells and if it's expressed in the white blood cells you have inflammation in the heart in HEF-PEF so it makes sense. So I then um, looked at um, RNA sequencing data that we had that uh, separated at least the cardiomyocytes from the non-cardiomyocyte data and we now soon have other cell types too to see which cell types it's actually expressed in the heart. So you can see here, so the cardiomyocytes only comprise about 30% of the cell types in the heart of the by number. And the rest of it is predominantly fibroblast and endothelial cells, also some macrophages and uh, smooth muscle cells and pericytes. So this is RNA sequencing data here, just showing um, that in the, in the cardiomyocyte fraction, you've got an enrichment for cardiac troponin T and troponin I. Sorry, I'll move this so I can't see my own slides because of the we're in front of it, there we go, um, in the cardiomyocyte fraction. And uh, in non-myocyte fraction, uh, it's depleted, whereas the mentin, a fibroblast marker and VWF, an endothelial cell marker, um, the, they're enriched in the non-myocyte fraction, in fact. Titan antisense actually seems in the heart to be enriched in the cardiomyocyte fraction here. In the non-myocyte fraction, it was really quite, the reads were very low. 
seeming to be mostly noise. So it seems as though in the heart, it is actually expressing the cardiac myocytes, just to make things more complicated. So um, one obvious question when thinking about what this long, long coding RNA could be doing, because not much at all is known about it other than it's present, is, is it directly regulating Titan expression? And an obvious uh, mechanism might be that it's inhibiting Titan. So because it's antisense, you've got complementary base pairing, you can express the antisense transcription, it directly binds to the, the sense transcript to suppress it. However, um, again, RNA sequencing data that we had already generated um, from dilated cardiomyopathy patients in Cambridge, as well as our own uh, medical center, MUMC, and just correlating Titan antisense with Titan expression in, in biopsy RNA sequencing data, there seems to be generally a positive correlation. So it's not as simple as it's just suppressing Titan um, directly. That'll be too easy. Another mechanism of these uh, antisense transcripts is uh, in splicing. So they, a few have been described before. Some go off and do something completely unrelated to the RNA. Some regulate splicing or uh, indirectly the expression. So whilst we couldn't really get good splicing information from the RNA-seq we generated, because you need to prepare the, the libraries in a certain way or do a certain type of sequencing, I could analyze it in, uh, by a PCR in some of the other samples I had. And this is just a couple of examples. First of all, some from some hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients here in collaboration with Yolanda van der Velde, um, and as well as in the pig model that I described earlier. Um, and interestingly, there's actually a negative correlation between Titan antisense expression and expression of the stiff isoform, no, the elastic isoform of Titan. So the higher the Titan antisense, there seems to be a less, why do I get this right, less elastic Titan. So you've got these two main isoforms in the adult heart, uh, N2B, which is the shorter, stiffer one, N2BA, which is the longer, more elastic one. Um, and this is mainly seen in the females, which is, um, again, very interesting seeing what we've seen. So you can see here in the female patients that there's at least a significant correlation. In the male patients, there wasn't so much. There was a slight trend. This is also very uh, significant, the correlation in the female pigs. So maybe this Titan antisense isn't just regulating overall expression of Titan, but it's splicing instead, which might um, indicate its role in uh, cardiomyocyte stiffening in HEFPEF. So the main, and I think probably the only uh, validated splicing factor of uh, Titan itself is RBM20, of which there's also mutations in dilated cardiomyopathy. So we, um, we had an antibody against this uh, RBM20 and we performed an RNA immunose precipitation. So in some of the cardiac bi biopsies from, from NASA in Germany, um, I uh, analyzed Titan antisense association with RBM20. And indeed, there's a very strong enrichment um, of Titan antisense with RBM20. Not too much change in disease. Um, I'm a little bit cautious about these particular experiments because what um, you do with a network rip is you cross-link everything and then pull it down. And RBM20 is regulating Titan. We already know that Titan antisense is opposite to Titan. So it could be it's in the same place at the same time. It's very likely if you cross-link everything, it's going to be pulled down. So I want to investigate this further, but I thought I'd just show this pilot study. It's a common uh, experiment that people do to look at at least an indirect association of, of two molecules. Um, but uh, more um, convincing uh, for the hypothesis um, is some in vitro uh, uh, data that I generated. So this is uh, adult mouse cardiomyocytes. And I actually used the method that uh, Davor and Matt described in their um, seminar uh, a few days ago. So I used this Lagendorff free adult mouse card in my site isolation. This is just wild type um, mice. Um, and I knocked down the Titan antisense, which took a bit of effort. It required a double transfection um, protocol, um, it's quite reasonably expressed, and then stimulated with endothelin one. And you can see here that um, with endothelium one, as you would expect, there is an increase in the classic hypertrophy markers, MPPA and PPB, um, actor one. Um, whereas when you knock down Titan antisense, uh, there's not such a degree of increase of the hypertrophy markers. Also, when I analyze the relative expression of the Titan isoforms, 
uh, there was a preservation of the uh, longer, more elastic Titan isoform relative to the stiffer isoform when you knock down Titan antisense one. Um, and again, this is fairly early days, so we'd also like to do some force contraction measurements on these. Um, so this is, uh, but it's a good indication that maybe part of the mechanism of Titan antisense. First of all, it reduces the hypertrophic stress, and second, maybe it does act on Titan isoform expression splicing. So this is uh, one working model, and as I said, it is early days. Um, so our working model is that um, in a, say, let's say a healthy heart, um, in the nucleus, you have um, lower attention to Titan antisense expression, Titan's expressed, and uh, not so much sprice, so you have more of the longer N2B elastic isoform of Titan present um, than in the cell, um, causing healthy cardiomyocytes, if you like, more elastic, healthy heart. This is obviously a very basic um, schematic. Then when we have some sort of stimulus, which we're still not sure what it is, inflammation, diabetes, hypertension, something to do with female sex um, in addition, and we have increase in Titan antisense expression, which maybe recruits our RBM20 to increase the splicing of, uh, of Titan, so you get more of the shorter N2B uh, form of, of Titan, which then causes increased stiffness, elasticity, and, and contributes to diastolic dysfunction. So that seems like quite a short talk. Hopefully there's time for lots of questions. Yeah, half an hour, that's what I said. So um, just an overview of the conclusions. So uh, we uh, hope we've we identified a female sex specific biomarker, um, maybe uh, in the heart, in white blood cells, in plasma. Um, it's showing some therapeutic uh, potential as a target. Um, in vivo, it's at least negatively correlated with compliant Titan, both in humans as well as in large animal models, and that's all going quite consistent. I just showed a couple of examples. In vitro, reducing Titan antisex expression seems to increase the Titan compliance, at least at the RNA levels um, of Titan isoforms, and reduces hypertrophic stress. So future perspectives for this study. Um, as I said, we're going to be validating uh, Titan antisense as a biomarker in multi-center as well as intercontinental um, trials. Um, we're very excited to, to do that. Um, Titan antisense function in the heart, looking in preclinical uh, HEF-PEF and HEF-REF models, is knocking down antisense beneficial, antisense one beneficial, is overexpressing it detrimental. So we've also, as a uh, counter experiment, we've had Titan antisense um, cloned into an AAV9 vector um, with a troponin T promoter. So this is cardiac specific overexpression to see if overexpressing it has the opposite effect um, and causes stiffening of the heart. I would also like to understand the sex specific upregulation of Titan antisense in the heart as well as in white blood cells. Um, so this is something that I would hope to be in the lab to work on now, but obviously I had to delay the experiments. Um, so looking at the role of sex hormones as well as epigenetic memory of the sex hormones, because a lot of these patients are postmenopausal. So we're also looking forward to investigating that further. So just uh, before I finish, I also would like to just say where I work. Maybe I should have started with this. So I work in Maastricht um, in the Netherlands. So for you, those of you who don't know, especially you're out of Europe, you might not know. So Maastricht is down here um, in the very uh, southern tip of the Netherlands. And it's very close to the border of Belgium and with Germany. So we have quite an inter international city, international university, just because of the location. And it's very pretty university town, as you can see here, this lovely panoramic picture. Um, and this is the medical center where we work. So we have the, the Faculty of uh, Health, uh, Medicine and Life Science joined with the, the university hospital so that we can all work together, clinicians and fundamental scientists. Um, and we like to host meetings, bring people to Maastricht. This is a meeting I hosted um, recently in Maastricht of the Cardio uh, RNA Network. So with that, thank you very much to everybody for listening. So thank you to my, uh, my PI, Stefan Heymans and Tillman Hacking, our Karim um, Institute head, to my collaborators in Leuven, um, in Royal Bochum, um, in University College Dublin, I guess you can read the rest, in Rotterdam, Dirk Dunker's group, Hester Din Rauter and Saskia de Jaeger. So they provided the, the um, instigate the, the helpful study. So they provide the samples for that. And Arantia in, in Navarra and my, uh, my funding bodies, so we're mainly funded by the Seaborn Early HEFPEF Consortium in, of the Dutch Heart Foundation, and I recently got a talent program grant from the Reconnect, 
and the EU Cardiorene Cost Action. And I just also like to highlight if I'm a bit scared to do this now, to be honest, but uh, next, uh, next year, there's the, the second um, Gordon Research Conference in Epigenetic Regulation of Cardiovascular Disease and the Gordon Research Seminars. This is the sort of training school just prior to the main conference. I'm chairing along with um, Hio Alexandrian. So hopefully that will go ahead in Hong Kong. So just uh, uh, to highlight that as well. And yes, get in touch uh, after this if you don't have questions now. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Okay. John, can you just unmute yourself, please? Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm, it seems a pity you don't get a round of applause now. That's the, the only uh, shame about this whole thing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, there's a lot of questions queuing up for, the, for you. So everyone's uh, really responding to this. But can I ask, um, some, from what you've been showing in terms of some of the gene changes, um, uh, and, and the long, long coding RNAs. It almost looks like two different diseases, one in male and one in female. Has, have you had third thoughts about that? Yes, yeah, so this is something that we are hoping to answer. So um, I'm very bad at giving things away. I should maybe just say we're just going to answer it somehow, but we're looking at doing um, single cell RNA sequencing in the hearts of HEFPEF. HEFPEF patients is more difficult, being some of these HEFPEF models. Um, to see if there's different, for example, um, different cell types in the heart. Uh, maybe there's, yeah, different sub-cell types. If it is a different disease in males to females, this is something clinicians as well as fundamental scientists are still trying to answer. But there's also, I, if I understand it, not only are there more female HEF-PEF patients, but more males progress into HEF-REF, whereas females tend to have a chronic sustained HEF-PEF phenotype. And we also saw that, or Dirk Dunker's group, I think, also saw that in the pigs. I hope I've got that right. So it does seem to be something different about these comorbidities that cause different changes in the heart in males to females. And so when you do the rat ones, do they have, do you get the same sex differences? Not quite. Um, although I haven't, uh, no, it's not quite the same, but then you also got the complication. Of course, these are young animals. You don't have the aging component. Um, and they, we haven't done any over or anything. So we haven't seen it in the rat. It was seen in the pig but not the rat, I believe. Okay, thank you. I'm sort of let somebody else have a question now. So, so from Sina Hadipur, do HEFPEF patients have increased incidence of other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis? That's a good question. Actually, I don't know if HEFPEF patients have our increased incidence of other inflammatory in diseases. Of course, females do. I think something like 80% of at least autoimmune disease patients are female. Um, but I don't know about that to the HEFPEF patients, I'm afraid. Thanks. And so there's a few uh, sort of technical ones now. One is which of the 80 splice variants, which exact one, uh, is the, is the, the TTN antisense? So there are, indeed, again, a bit like Titan. Thankfully, it's not quite as long as Titan, but there's lots of different, at least, transcripts. I think there's two main splice, uh, two main isoforms. And I focused on the one that was most highly upregulated in comparison in the monocytes. Um, of course, that could just be a snapshot. Maybe uh, I'm, I'm now not targeting the right one in the heart. What I've been trying to do is get a company um, to make me a nice custom plate so I can just analyze all the uh, transcripts on one plate. Otherwise, I'm doing 80 qPCRs for every single sample. The only way to do it is to sequence everything. So I am focusing on the one that seemed to show the biggest upregulation in the initial data. And I agree that I should, um, with RNA sequencing, we can at least see the whole picture, but for every qPCR, I'm not, I'm just focusing on one, this two. So thank you. So uh, Pregna Das asks how you do qPCR and plasma sam samples, whether you mean, mean blood samples? I have plasma samples. Um, we isolated the, the RNA from plasma. We've done blood as well. And because they're in the white blood cells too, you get higher values. So we're also gonna look at where the blood might be better to look at than plasma. Because of course the plasma samples, you do get the, the CT values are quite high. So sensitivities may be lower. So what we also want to do is maybe look at blood instead, whole blood might be better. Okay. But it's it detectable in plasma. Uh, and so, um, thank you. And uh, so, Atal Kashyap uh, asks which sequencing technique was used, RNA depletion or poly A? 
Um, yep, so this is total, I think, for everything I showed. No, I'm lying. For the first RNA sequencing in the monocytes, uh, it was poly A. So that indicates the type 90 sense is also polyadenylated. For like most of the other I, uh, I showed was RNA, uh, ribosomal RNA depleted, because I try not to miss things out. But the first data set was poly A. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And so Sina Hodipur again, um, asking whether it's possible to use the Titan antisense to provide information regarding pro prognosis or severity and in, in increases and decreases. Yes, so that's what we're hoping to do in these big, uh, say, trials in when we have the helpful study and the track study with 300 patients, because we do hold obviously degrees of severity within that. So we're going to overlay it with the clinical data. Um, with biopsies, you usually just get one at some sort of end stage. Of course, it's more difficult to look at it in the heart of humans anyway. Um, so we're going to look at that in the, in, the, in, the, in the biomarker study. And then uh, Gabriella Chitarella, I'm sorry about that, uh, asked the sole source of the plasma uh, titan antisense, whether it was just the monocytes? Yes, yeah, so this is a question um, that I don't know. So what I don't know is indeed is the heart secreting Titan antisense into the plasma? Is it the white blood cells releasing it? Um, are the white blood cells just picking it up from the heart? In fact, uh, these are all questions that I'm, I have got some pilot data on, but I haven't fully uh, understood. So I, the source of the Titan antisense in the plasma, I don't know if it's from the heart or the monocytes. Okay, thank you. Um, Atel Kachat asks, are you also going to look for miRNA? Did you do that? I thought you did. Yeah. MicroRNA. Um, as in, I wonder um, if you mean as in whether it's a sponge for microRNAs. Um, so there's certainly microRNA binding sites in Titan Antisense. It's very long. Um, so that is something that, um, that, I could, that I could look at. It was on my list originally, and then I found this effect on the splicing. Um, so maybe that's, that's what it means. Um, is it a sponge? Could also so be microRNA is regulating it too, of course. You can clarify it using either chat or Q and A again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so, uh, so Hector Ch Chapoy asks, do you know why this uh, up, re up regulation of, of the antisense is only in women? I think it's a, you know six to a thousand dollar question, really. But yeah. yes, yes. So um, we're looking at several things. So obviously. Um, the patient's data that I showed, uh, or the, the human data I showed, all the individuals were per postmenopausal, um, um, because it's a big age component also with HEF-PEF. So a, a clear estrogen is driving it is obviously is not that simple. Um, in some in vitro, um, in some publicly available uh, NGS data from in vitro studies that have just stimulated cells with estrogen, both Titan and Titan antisense come up as upregulated targets, but neither have a canonical estrogen receptor binding site. So we're looking at an, either an indirect activation and seeing as it's postmenopausal women, maybe there's some sort of epigenetic role, epigenetic memory that primes the promoter to be um, to upregulate it later, even though estrogen might not be there anymore. So I don't know yet, but I've got lots of thoughts. Okay, thank you. And um, Camille Kobach's asking what kind of cells in the heart are expressing the antisense? I think you maybe do, do you have a slide on that? Yeah, so I guess I answered that. So it yeah. seems though in the heart, they may have a slide, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, uh, there's uh, Sina Hedipur apologizing for another question, but saying, um, can you pick this HFPEF with earlier than, than imaging with this biomarker? Um, that's a good question because I suppose mostly when we have even in the, the the cohorts we'll look at, we'll have imaging data that coincides with the blood data. So I don't know if it's it's more about what stage of the diastolic dysfunction you can pick it up. But I don't know if it will be earlier than the diagnostic imaging. I don't know how we would find out if they've got any degree of diastolic dysfunction if we don't do imaging. Yes, that's a difficult one, isn't it? You're yeah. only do it yeah. when they start to complain of symptoms, really. Yeah. But, and well, until you get to the screening type of thing, which is a long way down the line, I should have thought. Yeah. Um, good. Um, uh, so what's the correlation between the antisense and the CD14 counting patients and, and in plasma? It's, yeah. Again, about whether it's actively secreted by the monocytes, yeah. Ah, in the plasma. 
Yeah, that's that's a good point. I don't think because for the monocyte data we used, even though there's more monocytes, we use the same number of monocytes for the analysis. So that's not the confounding factor there. But is it affecting the plasma? Yeah, there's that they are. There was an association there. So it, it could be that that's true. And we don't know if they're actively secreted. I also don't know yet if Titan antisense is uh, in extracellular vesicles or if it's free. Seeing as it's quite stable in the plasma, it could be in extracellular vesicles. That's also something I need to look at. Um, the, the next one by Hector Chaboy, I think that's a, a sort of follow up to the sort of companion to the other one he was asking. Um, so, um, Athel Kashyap again, could you share some details about the sequencing data analysis pipeline? Um, yes, I used, um, as you, I don't know if you recognize that, that. Uh, the visualization tool and analysis tool is called SeekMonk, uh, made at the Abraham Institute. And I used uh, DSeq2, so that's the program in R. Um, that's luckily you can link to SeekMonk, um, so you can do the analysis directly from SeekMonk in R. I don't know if there was more he wanted to know. Well, they, they yeah. could always get back to you if, yeah. if that's the case. So, yeah, if there's more things to, to know later. And so when you get to the animals, are the PCR regions the same as for the human ones? Yeah, so in the mouse, for example, um, the Titan antisense, <laughs> as it's annotated now, is much shorter. So, and there doesn't seem to be multiple transcripts quite like there is in the humans. So in fact, the animals are a lot more straightforward. Um, with regards to the region they're overlapping compared to Titan, that they are similar, yeah. But in the animals, there doesn't seem to be so many multiple transcripts. At the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, Camille Kobach, uh, do you know any, any factors increasing the expression of the Titan antisense in vitro? Yeah, so um, endothelium 1 seems to, so classic hypertrophy markers. Um, we also we would like to also try stimulating white blood cells in vitro as well, um, but we haven't done that yet. So, I'm just hoping to do some cell experiments now. but. Yeah, it's a good question. Exactly what's stimulating the expression? I don't know yet. So again, in terms of the different cells in the heart, so macrophage, uh, is it sim and macrophages as well as cardiomyocytes? And does it have the same similar function in macrophage and, and cardiomyocyte? So I could, uh, I could do a, here's some slides I made earlier, but maybe that risks getting into a whole other talk. Um, so in uh, or at least in monocytes, um, or sorry, uh, in circulating white blood cells. So one question is, is Titan antisense actually made in the white blood cells or is it just taking it up from the heart or the plasma? So I've looked at at least nascent RNA. So as many long long coding RNAs are, it's also spliced. So you think if it was just picking it up, you'd only get the mature form in the, in the white blood cells, but actually you also get nascent RNA in the white blood cells that implies that it is actually being made in the white blood cells. But again, I might, I'm might i going to use more sensitive techniques to look at that. Um, in the white blood cells, Titan antisense seems to be located more in the cytoplasm compared to the nucleus, whereas in cardiomyocytes, it seems to be more in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Um, I could go on. I could go on on this question. Shall I carry on? I got, so. <laughs> well, we got, have got quite a lot of questions, so perhaps we should we should just. Uh, okay. So uh, we think it's doing something different, actually, in the different cell types, just to make life easy for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So Nicolo Mangrati um, asks whether the Titan locus also produces circular uh, RNA. Um, uh, or, so is this a non-circularized form, the long, long non-coding RNA of the same transcribed or does it come from a different variant? I'm not sure I read that out correctly, to be honest. So yes, is absolutely right. Um, together with Roger Fu, so they published his paper on the landscapes um, with uh, Wilson Tan uh, looking at uh, all the circular RNAs in the human heart and Titan antisense. Uh, I think there was at least 12 circular RNAs generated from Titan antisense. Um, most of them, uh, had very low expression. I have analyzed the couple that had high expression. Um, they're also detectable in the heart as well as um, in the plasma. Um, I haven't looked too much further into them yet, um, but they seem to actually be upregulated um, more in HEFREF than HEFPEF just to make life easier <laughs> for ourselves. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, what's the titan expression levels in the RIP for the uh, uh, TTN antisense for the, the HEFPEF samples? Do they correlate? Ah, that's true. I, I didn't pull down titan with RBM20. That would have been a very good positive control, though. I agree. So that was quite preliminary data, but that's a, that's a, good, that's a good plan. Thank you. That was supposed to be a tip. Yeah, you get some good ideas here anyway. Yeah. That's good. Um, which of the five blocks of gene alignment between mice, human, uh, titan did you knock down with the GAPMA in the adult mice cardiomyocytes? So we used uh, two sets of GAPMAs to start with to make sure that we, it's difficult because it's not that well annotated in the mouse. We're going from, you know, the data we have available, but we used two sets to make sure we can knock out both of the, the whole length of the transcript. Um, not knowing too much about it. I don't quite understand this. Of the five blocks of gene alignment. And, um, and the same, possibly the same person out a little while below asked in the gap mode samples, do the adjacent genes change in mRNA expression? Mm -hmm. So um, these, some, uh, these antisense transcripts can also act in, in trans, in, on neighboring genes. And again, that I haven't looked at. I haven't looked at that. So thank you. Okay, so Diogo Masera, Masquera, asks whether you've compared long encoding RNA expression between between species and used mouse cells for some of your in vitro experiments. Were well, you compared? Mm -hmm. the, qu the question is, how conserved is the long encoding RNA sequence between well, species? Yeah, so we're lucky in that because it's opposite. It's uh, antisense to Titan. It's very well conserved because Titan is. So we're looking at a sort of eighty percent homology between mouse and human, which is high for long non-coding RNA. Um, yeah, it's opposite Titan, so I guess uh, that, that helps. So um, Llewellyn uh, Roderick is asking whether the change in antisense doesn't seem very great, actually seem quite great to me, but you, could this be diagnostic or would you use it in combination with other biomarkers? Are there any other biomarkers? Uh, hi, Lou. <laughs> um, so I, changing the AS in disease, what, what does that stand for in this case, do you think? Antisense, uh, antisense. Oh, antisense. Yeah, sorry. So alternative splicing, it could be lots of things. Um, okay, seemed very great. So in the HEFPEF um, females, yeah, yeah, it was between six and eight fold. The animals, it was less. Um, but we will, um, so when we do the biomarker studies, we have also CRP levels, BMP levels troponin levels um, so we will also look at it in combination with other biomarkers and um, which a lot of the biomarkers are doing now the idea is we'll have a panel rather than a just one gold standard so we'll also look at it in in combination yes um and he also says nice talk sorry and great progress later on so just <laughs> his manners at that point um so um Jordi Cooken asks how long is the uh, titan antisense um so would you be able to fully process it into an aav yes so we're lucky in that the mouse form as i said is is not as long at least seemingly as a human form so we put the mouse form into the aav because i wanted to overexpress the, the mouse form in the mouse um so it's about 800 base pairs in the mouse that we put into an aav that was just about feasible okay yeah. good uh, thank you. Uh, Fabio Martelli, uh, I think you, you started off on the macrophages, so you, you um, have, have got, said most of what you can say on that at the moment, or, yeah, or, so, or, or it's a whole other talk. Yeah, so Fabio Mayner, we have a feeling that actually there's a, a couple of potential open reading frames in Titan Antisense for encoding micropeptides, um, and one of them we've lined it up with publicly available ribo, uh, ribo foot, ribosome footprinting data. So actually showing where ribosomes bind that might be translated. One of them, there wasn't much of a, a footprint. Uh, one of them, there seemed to be a strong footprint in white blood cells. So our theory at the moment is that in white blood cells, maybe it's encoding the micropeptide, which is also why it's in the cytoplasm more than in the cardiomyocytes, where there doesn't seem to be a footprint in, in striated muscle for this micropeptide site. So that's one potential. As I said, it's very um, tenuous right now. So I didn't want to present the data, but that's a theory. Okay, so good. Thank you very much. Um, have you checked the um, existing RNA-seq data with estradiol-treated human cells? 
um, and there's, I'm sure that this, this, this next bit is connected. Is the, is the antisense detected in iPS cells or uh, the RNA seq from there? Yes, I don't know about iPS cells yet, but that's um, no. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I do know about iPS cells. I think Matt did some for me, and it is detected in iPS cells, although not as highly. So um, in uh, development, so RNA sequencing data, again, publicly available from cardiomyocytes in development, the titan antisense is present, but very low. So it does seem to increase um, in the adult heart or be higher. Um, and we have, I think I just uh, discussed a bit earlier, we have looked at existing RNA-seq data from estradiol cheated cells, um, and we see that titan and titan antisense um, are, are regulated by estrogen, but we must be indirect because they don't have estrogen receptors anywhere near the promoters. So, yeah, we're trying to figure that out. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, uh, I've lost the name here. Uh, Mar Mary Jose Gumans is, is, is saying great talk and asking what would be the best uh, HEFPEF model to do this single cell sequencing in. Um, is that going to, are, are other species going to give you trouble? Hi, Mary Jose. Thank you for your question. Um, give you trouble um i don't know about give you trouble so we'd uh, we are looking also at using the um the, the model from joe hill and gabriella who asked the question earlier um who uh, used high fat diet and l name to induce hefpef and um partly because obviously mice are easier to handle than rats or pigs at least in the first instance so um, we, I have those tissues in the freezer now to analyze. Um, I want to make sure that titan antisense is also regulated in those. And if it is, we'd like to do single cell sequencing in that model as well. Um, when we knock down the titan antisense and overexpress it, so we can really see on a cell by cell basis how the titan antisense is affecting titan or other things in that cell. So that's the plan at the moment. I think doing it in the pig model would also be really interesting. Okay, so keep going. We're, we're seeing the end now, so you know it's we're going get, nearly getting there. So, um, where do you think? Uh, so, Jasmine Raya asks, where do you think the origin of the long co non coding RNA is in the plasma? And uh, is it enriched in exosomes? Uh, have you looked at it in monocyte derived macrophages? Um, any of those things? Yes. Hi, Jasmeet. Um, as I said, we, we still need to find out if it's an extracellular vesicles in the plasma. Um, seeing as it's present and at least at a reasonable level, it may well be. Um, no, we haven't. We have macrophages from the ZSF1 rat. I haven't yet looked um, in them, though. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Antonio Salgado Samazo asks, did you have the opportunity to measure your candidate long coding car um, uh, RNA on the CD14 and the animal models or the effect, I suppose. Hi, Antonio. No, we haven't yet. We have, um, we're going to be starting to collect at least, yeah, PBMCs and then freezing them so that we can um, isolate the different cell types later from the rat as well as from the pig. But no, I haven't yet um, looked in the animal models in the white blood cells. Um, uh, then Simona Greco asked whether you had a correlation, or checked the correlation of the antisense with the imaging echo parameters? Uh, yeah, thank you, Simona. Um, so we have such the, the human data I showed, both in the plasma and the, the biopsies at the moment, of quite small N numbers in about 20. Um, I do have most echo parameters for those, and I, I, sh I should overlay them. I just, I think I thought because it's such low N numbers that I wouldn't really, um, especially with the comorbidities and the variability you get in human samples anyway. But maybe I should do it just to see if there's any indication already. I was waiting for the bigger data sets, but maybe I should look already. Okay. Um, Rashita Bachi asks um, if you can comment on the origin of the cir sort of circular troponin versus the long non-coding troponin antisense, say variant, different variant. Um, I'm going to have to look at which particular, I know we followed up on a couple of the circular RNAs, as I said, most of them were very, had very low expression. And I'm going to have to look at exactly where they are. I have a feeling they're further along the transcript than, than the, the transcript that I was using in the PCR. But I'll, I'll get back to you on that, Rashita. Okay, uh, so any clue for the intracellular localization of this long non coding RNA? So, yeah, as I think I discussed that in the heart, in the cardiomyocytes, it's predominantly nuclear, whereas in the monocytes, it's predominantly cytoplasmic, that's sort of 80 20% each way. So, um, And uh, Rio Juni asks whether. 
um, you think the antisense is shed by the cardiomyocytes and picked up by the monocytes. Yeah, so as I said, uh, Rio, hi. Um, I would like to do also, there's a method called nascent RNA-seq. So that actually identifies ideally whether you actually have nascent transcription in the monocytes. As I said, I, it seems to be the case. Nascent RNA-seq really looks at where it's binding to the RNA polymerase. There's some other more uh, sophisticated methods like uh, TT chem -seq, I think it's called, where you use uh, thiouridine to actually track transcription as it's happening. Obviously, that's only possible um, in vitro, not in vivo. So we are going to look at a bit more sophisticated methods as to whether it's really transcribed in the monocytes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, the next person is asking whether you're planning to uh, look at um, the hormonal levels, early, late postmenopausal or hormone replacement therapy. So surprisingly, whether or not they're on hormone replacement therapy isn't a uh, data commonly collected, which surprised me quite a lot. Um, certainly not in our clinic anyway. Um, I don't have the number of years since menopause. Obviously, I have age, but that's very generic. So no, I haven't done that. No, um, but I'm, I'm going to make sure in the biggest cohorts that we have information as to whether they're on hormone replacement therapy or not. But I haven't correlated it with time since the menopause. I think the level of estrogens go down quite quickly after menopause, if I remember rightly. But. So anyway, um, uh, I said we're getting to the end, but people keep adding things on to the end, so we're not getting to the end. So I just wonder, we're, we're, we're getting to six o'clock now, so I wonder, um, shall, we, shall we wrap this up? What do you yeah, think? Shall I, I'll, I will copy and paste all the rest of the answers and get back to people. I think I know most people who've asked questions. But, so may I just say that obviously it's completely up to you to how long you want to keep going. There's no time limit on this. So absolutely up to you, both of you. Uh, well, um, yes. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Well, what do you think, Emma? I mean, we have got to the, the, the time and people okay. and it's start, starting to drop out now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to people and answer these specific yeah, I think that would be fine. Um, okay, so you, you've done a huge amount. You've been answering questions for 25 minutes, so that's, that's brilliant. So thank you very much again, and uh, that was really a stunning talk, I would have said. So thank you for, for that. I'm handing you back to David now. Well, Emma, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, absolutely amazing effort. You've gone through a lot of questions. And, and Sean, thank you for chairing because uh, this is not my area. I, and I would not have even been able to read a lot of these things, let alone uh, chair it. So I'd like to thank everybody who's still with us. And once again, just to thank the ISHR for all the help and um, enjoy the weekend and see you all hopefully on Monday. Thank you very much. Week. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, bye. bye. bye.